Hello everybody. Today uh, we're going to record another episode of Leadership in Blue Jeans. Today uh, with my two guests, Miwara Borozan, who is a leadership coach, leadership consultant and former sales and marketing executive. And Raluca Radu, who is the country manager for uh, Answer in Romania. Welcome to the both of you. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. Nice to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Likewise. Um, I wanted to today to take us a little bit back on memory lane um, <laughs> to the time when both of you stepped into your first people manager role. So, okay. uh, and uh, what I want to explore a little bit with you is when you think back to that time, what were the challenges that you actually found the moment you stepped yourself in? into this uh, people manager role that you didn't have before? What was the most prevalent struggle, so to speak? Okay. Any one of you can go first. I, I can go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so for me, um, it was, first of all, thank you for inviting me here. <laughs> um, and my first, uh, let's say, people manager role, it was rather a supervision. Uh, a supervisor role and it came uh, quite early in my career so I was 21 years old um, and uh, I remember that uh, the main challenge was um, one question and one struggle which I had being in charge of a team of uh, 15 people um, and um, I was the one hiring and I was the one firing the same people so I couldn't understand what's, uh, what's going on uh, because I was quite diligent in all the um, activities and then uh, being, let's say, in this struggle I understood what uh, cultural fit means and how important it is to, to match the profile of the person with the profile of the company. But that came after like one year of going uh, trial and error. Yeah, but uh, let me ask you um, a little bit uh, deeper into what you just said. Um, are, you, are you saying that the, uh, the concept of that you're both bringing people on board, but that you also have to evaluate and exactly. potentially, uh, you know, terminate their contracts Correct. was something that what was that did it feel not right to you, or what was it? No, I was um, let's say intrigued by the fact that uh, I was still um, let's say giving credit to the person, so they were not a bad person. Mm -hmm. They were uh, coming to work uh, to do good things, but still their performance was not picking up, and they were also performing very well because checking the references mm. in other companies. So I couldn't put everything together and understand where is the missing link and oh, what no, is the I error. <laughs> so mm -hmm. uh, and then I going deeper and uh, of course trying to, to enlarge my knowledge as well. Uh, I understood this match of, uh, of culture uh, between the employee and the company. Right. I understand now. So, yeah. Does it resonate with you too? I think if I, if I think at my first time manager role, mm -hmm. I think uh, what comes to my mind first is that I really had an imposter syndrome. Just like Miwara, I was also very young and I was a first time manager for, I was 22, I think. And uh, I was managing a team of 80 people and I was the youngest, if I'm not mistaken, or exactly, something yeah, like the this. Same for me. And yes, first of all, I remember <laughs> the imposter syndrome. <laughs> so, yeah. And uh, what's very funny now for me, and I was thinking about this a week ago, is that in all my first three or four roles as a manager, I always felt like I was uh, either the youngest or, for example, once I was managing an automotive classified team at another job and I was a woman, I wasn't a very good driver and all my my uh, team was composed of men <laughs> with a lot of prejudices about women drivers and so on. <laughs> and uh, I always had this, I was the youngest, I was a woman, there was always something like a struggle to overcome there 
And what's very funny now for me is, th is that now I'm 36 and I'm the oldest in my team. And now, because I'm managing a digital team, I still have an imposter syndrome <laughs> <laughs> because I'm the only one who is not using TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, this is the first thing that comes to mind. And I think that in the first role, I had to overcome both um, managing myself and getting over this part yeah. of not feeling quite in the right shoes and feeling like I have to learn. And at the same time, I have people who need to look up to me and to lead them in the right direction. And also, yes, we had big challenges and big goals to get to. How did you overcome it then in the end? I think I have a very, I'm, I think it's my personality to just go with it. <laughs> I just go for it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I, I, it was a rule I made back then in my first manager role that I don't, I shouldn't think about all this. I shouldn't think about feeling as an imposter and so on because it's not about me. It's about them. It's about the team. And ever since I made this switch, I think things became easier. It's really a mindset thing. Yes, yeah. yes. But if, if I may, I yeah, sure. think I think that you had this at the beginning. So yes, no yes. matter what, I will go forward. But after that, I think that confidence comes with achievements. So once that you started exactly. to, to get results. Is there a tip there anywhere for uh, first time managers and maybe in the sense of um, do it often enough and then you finally become it? Well, I think it's always, uh, you know, depending on the person, but uh, yes, you have to be uh, centered on yourself very much. <laughs> uh, so um, the tip that I have now is uh, believe in yourself, no matter how, uh, how you feel about the role and or the, how the team uh, is uh, feeling you. Because sometimes uh, what Raluca mentioned about the imposter syndrome, is our you know confirmation bias we feel like this and then the team is just you feel that they are looking at you like that uh, so believe in yourself that's the first one and the uh, second uh, be open to learn because it kind of has to go together doesn't it so yeah. on the one hand side you have to overcome a feeling of that you may not be ready and potentially everyone yeah. is seeing it but you have to, it's not enough to just fake it until you make it, right? So you have to also understand where you have to actually catch up. Yeah. Yeah. You have to be self-aware. So you're gonna, how are you going to get a TikTok account now? <laughs> I got it. Already. Yeah, I'm just trying to fit in. <laughs> now she's trying I'm the second stage. <laughs> <Right. laughs> No, exactly. she, she wants to overcome, so she will come with the great performance 10 uh, TikTok account <laughs> at the end of the year. <laughs> exactly. Studying it first and then hitting it. <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. Okay, next to imposter syndrome and culture, culture fit, by the way, let me just uh, okay. stay there uh, for a moment. So we, we bring people on board that fit a particular bill. Like uh, if you want to hire a developer, then or certain... Yes. You know, languages to, with a certain proficiency level. So you're saying that's not enough of a criterion for bringing someone on board? Well, if we are talking about competencies, mm -hmm. no. Uh, I think that uh, you have to be extremely attentive to, to the leadership profile, even if it is not about a leader role, mm -hmm. because uh, hopefully everybody hired in an organization to keep the people, to grow the people. And then if we are talking about uh, leadership profiles, which are some part innate, uh, you will, if that is not matching, you will discover that the person at a certain point is delivering, but it could be a toxic person in the organization because it's different, does not cope with uh, the way things are. And then, you know, it's. Uh, I think this is a very difficult case, uh, and uh, sometimes I believe I'm not advocating, but I believe that's why toxic people still stays in the organization because they deliver. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so I would say that cultural fit should be the first thing uh, in uh, in recruitment, and then uh, the skills, where everybody says today, and I think it is true. I mean, I subscribe to that. Mm -hmm. That uh, skills. Um, 
can be learned and no, acquired. When you were mentioning that about toxic people, I, I, I sensed that uh, Luca was um, putting back into her mind a personal memory about that. I think many. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I also, in my experience, also cultural fit is very important. And uh, I uh, read a book that I think summed it up very well by Patrick Lencioni, The Ideal Team Player. Mm -hmm. And I think it resonates with what I also discovered through my experience that it's very important to hire people who are motivated for a job, who are hungry, as mm. he describes in that book, and yes, who are also a cultural fit. He says in that book, who are not jackasses, who are people no. that are team players. Yeah. Right. No, that yeah. makes sense. Um, but however, there's an interesting discussion that happened in the recent years about that cultural fit is also at least in larger corporations, uh, kind of an unfortunate factor. Because by cultural fit, you start to more and more hire and focus people that are exactly like you. Meaning, it's cause, it costs you the diversity. This also happened to me. <laughs> yes, it did. Recently. I also, I don't know, I'm asking myself this question. I don't really have uh, an answer for it. But uh, yes, recently I think uh, I, we brought in our team people who are uh, different from our culture, so to say. They are team players, and they, but they are different in certain mm. ways. And I think that, yes, even though some things don't work the same, through the, you don't get from A to B on the same uh, journey, still it somehow fits and it challenges the status quo. I don't know how it will be till the, till the end, but it's also something I'm working on. <laughs> I'm really thinking how it's going to be. You know, listening to both of you, it really seems to me like this, this whole question is like a potentiometer. You can only set it to one setting and not to multiple at once. So if you favor cultural fit, you pay the price in diversity. If you favor diversity, you may um, pay a price on maybe unnecessary conflict and, and other things that are going down in the team. Frank, I tend to disagree. <laughs> because <clears throat> culture of fit uh, um, doesn't mean that uh, everybody should be like you. So it's not like uh, uh, you have a profile uh, and then you clone the person. Uh, in culture of fit, the culture itself should invite for diversity. Uh, if we are discussing about uh, companies which are extremely performant, uh, I mean, today, we are talking about shared leadership, so it's not one man show, one woman show. It's uh, these are the teams mm -hmm. which are winning, and a winning team cannot be uh, composed by people alike. I mean, they are alike in some uh, areas, like we were discussing about, uh, you know, the values that you believe in, uh, some behaviors, but they should be complementary. So, uh, and I, am, I bet that they are complementary. That is why they are striving. So cultural fit, uh, it is what you say, more like me. If it is about a company where the founder is there <laughs> and everything should be like him and he should not be disturbed. Uh, but uh, that's uh, okay. Of course, uh, everybody has the mm -hmm. freedom to, to decide on how they do business. Uh, but I do not see cultural fit as uh, the, the obstacle for diversity in a company which promotes performance. Okay, so instead of uh, reacting to your disagreement, I'm going to ask <laughs> Daluka what she thinks. So I think it's, uh, yeah, I think you are summed it up well. It's about cultural fit in certain values, but mm. maybe there shouldn't be more than, I don't know, a handful <laughs> of values, so that they also leave room for diversity, something yeah. like this. So I think we're getting there somewhere. So uh, in <laughs> essence, you're, you're both saying there are some, un, how do you say, uncompromisable aspects yeah. of a culture mm -hmm. and other ones are more free to explore in, in diversity. Yeah. Such as, for example, at the uncompromisable ones would be certain values by which we want to live by, communicate, exactly. show, yeah. show up at work, our actions and behaviors. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Uncompromisable. Now, again, when you would meet your former self. Yes. How could you teach them that? 
How could you teach yourself, your former self in the past when just you stepped into the first role? Here's how you hire people. I guess for myself at that time, it was a lack of knowledge. So, uh, and I was eager to know more. Uh, I didn't have the, the framework, so uh, it's not so difficult to, to teach that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just to, to have the framework to work with, to understand which are the important things. Uh, but by the time uh, to have a mentor, to have a coach mm. was something, I mean, I, I don't know when I heard the first time that. So it was not <laughs> uh, something so not common, mm. but uh, sure, it yeah. so um, <laughs> and uh, uh, I remember that um, because it was just some like six, seven years after uh, the end of uh, past period uh, mm. in our country. <laughs> Uh, and uh, the way that leadership was perceived, at least, was that uh, the leader should lead by fear, by, you know, that is respect. So you have to, to mm. be afraid of the leader, which has, I was completely against. Therefore, I was not knocking on the doors to ask for advice because I knew yeah, what right. the advice is and I would, didn't like it. So, mm. <laughs> <laughs> so better not ask. it's better to find my way. Yeah. <laughs> um, but of course, uh, now uh, uh, resources are much more available. So uh, you can learn from various sources, from great people. Uh, mm -hmm. At that time, it was not so, uh, so obvious, yeah. or at least not for me. Anything to add? I was luckier from this point of view. I had a coach ever since my first management role. It came with the organization. Oh, super. <laughs> so, yeah. yes, I think this helped me a lot. Yeah. But also, I'm a, I'm a self-learner, so if I don't learn it by myself, it doesn't really help me if someone tells me. So mm. I wouldn't change anything in my experience. I think it was best that I learned through experience through my mistakes because I wouldn't have learned otherwise. Yeah. I love reading and I read a lot. I also take a lot of feedback, but still, if I don't to make that mistake myself, if I don't go for that decision and maybe it proves wrong, I don't learn well, stuff. It's, it's so. the strongest learning this way. Yes, <laughs> At least but the, the one that's also most takes more time sometimes. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, so we had cultural fit, we had the imposter syndrome, which kind of comes for a lot of people with the package yes. in the beginning. Anything else that when you remember back then you struggled with as being a leader once you have been promoted a manager? I was not struggling, uh, but I recall now uh, and I miss, it was the playfulness. It was this um, uh, always, uh, you know, the uh, the desire to try something new. As Raluca mm -hmm. was mentioning, uh, I don't think that uh, I need to learn by mistakes, but I need to learn by doing myself. Uh, mm -hmm. So, and of course, uh, like everyone, I was trying to get as many information as possible to make sure that if I fail, I can also come back. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and it was uh, always uh, a way of uh, doing things. So it was like a search, a discovery, let's right. put it. Uh, and uh, that uh, is not the same when you become uh, you know, manager of people leading other people. Mm. So, because <laughs> it's a bit different uh, and uh, you have to be more structured. Of course, you have to combine things, but uh, yeah. Yeah, we'll get there also in a minute. Yeah, okay. uh, anyway, is there anything else that you remember from your time back then? I really also remember this enthusiasm. And I think the first challenge is something that I also see often in my teams. Uh, I think the first challenge was to realize that now my job was to no longer do things myself, but to do things through other people. And I think this is the first switch that I had to do. And it was a struggle in the beginning yeah. because I'm also mm -hmm. a perfectionist and I, it was complicated to let coach somebody else to do things and to let them do yeah. things maybe their way which is something different i'm glad you bring this into the discussion because frankly i was actually thinking that when i ask this entry questions one of the first things you come out with because almost everyone um has to make the switch that 
that they come from being an individual contributor to being a manager really changes everything, you know, and uh, being feeling ready to let go of that. And also putting the empowerment and the trust in the people that you know manage, they sure. can do that, what you used to do, <laughs> and not micromanage them to death, is a big step for most people. Yeah. And they'd like to add something here with yeah. the micromanagement. So yeah, first I had to learn as a manager uh, hired by an organization to make the switch from micromanager to mm -hmm. a leader. And once I learned that in every organization I was, I thought it was something uh, quite that came quite easy to me. And then when I started my own company yeah. as an entrepreneur, I had to learn this skill all over again. <laughs> how? How? Why? How, what happened there? Because uh, micromanagement management really came back to me. It was. <laughs> It was much more difficult as mm. an entrepreneur. And I think I'm still a bit struggling with this. And I think that I've, um, yeah, I took some steps back uh, from this skill because it, uh, um, I think the fear is much bigger when it's your company yeah. and your clients and you feel the responsibility so much more than mm. when it's just a job. And I remember that I was uh, judging the founders of the companies which were still there and were not letting me do my job as a manager and so on. Yeah. But now, <laughs> from the founders' <laughs> shoes, I can see where they were coming from. Interesting, I, right? We yeah. sometimes just need to change the perspective and all of a sudden we can understand where people are coming from. It exactly. doesn't always make it better because apparently you're trying to fight that instinct. Yes. Where it makes sense, at least. <clears throat> yeah. mm -hmm. I was smarter as an employee, <laughs> I <Yeah>. think. <laughs> we kind of softly transitioned to uh, my second question, which was about how did those leadership challenges for you change the moment you went into a much more senior roles? What were the, 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 I don't know, the topics of leadership out of a sudden that you may not have seen as much as a junior leader? Uh, for me, it was always to inspire people, so that became a must. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, then... Stay there a little. Uh, inspire people, how, what do you mean? Um, build, uh, besides, uh, luckily I was working uh, with multinationals, uh, which had their vision. Uh, so I didn't mm. have to build up the vi this vision or mission, and so everything uh, was uh, well connected. Uh, but uh, that can be something on the wall, or that can be something that each member of your team knows and how they should relate to it and how their work impacts uh, that uh, mission, vision, mm. and or contributes rather than say. Uh, so each role uh, which I had, uh, the first thing uh, was uh, how can, I mean, first for me to understand <laughs> what I am going to do the, here and how and uh, which is uh, the way to perform and to, uh, to empower my team to have this kind of belief so that they have this fuel and this drive to, to go by themselves. So you're saying that uh, later on, like stepping into the uh, higher responsibility roles, we actually discovered the uh, not just the power, but also the need for inspiration? Yes, that's a must. Mm. In the way that uh, I would like my team to, to feel at work. So yeah. uh, it's, uh, it's definitely a must. They must understand to what they are contributing. Mm. So that was one. And, yeah. mm, I think I also discovered uh, along the way that I have to balance these team leadership skills that uh, I had acquired with higher and higher responsibilities with, for example, with cash flow responsibilities, also with responsibilities of winning the market maybe or of reaching some goals. And sometimes it was a struggle to balance the two because maybe the team felt like I don't know, maybe it's time now to slow down, but for the organization, it wasn't the time mm. to slow down. So I think that's also a challenge. And also as an entrepreneur, I found this uh, a struggle. Yeah. So how did you, uh, what's your way of selling that, so to speak, that you 
when your team wants something different than you should sensibly I think it to. comes down to what Miwara was saying. You have to inspire them and to try to align the agendas to sell the goal yeah. of the company to the people so that they really know what they are contributing to and uh, so that their personal goals are somehow al aligned with the company's mm -hmm. goals. Yeah. So if we would ask uh, the people on your team right now or the, or the people on your, on your former team, um, if they could express to us what their contribution and their purpose is, would they know what to say? Of course, that was my uh, my goal, and uh, to make sure that everybody can do it in maximum two lines. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you know, the big strategy is lost when people have to open the computer, <laughs> find the PowerPoint, and uh, uh, discuss about strategy. So f f we need to be operational. We need to, to make it uh, and to embed in our own life, daily life, not uh, something that we academically talk about. <laughs> Is inspiration um, for you also important in the context of communicating the values that the company sure. puts forward? Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Do you do this in, your, in the day to day? Uh, or is it more a uh, planned activity? Uh, yeah, hold on, before you answer, yeah. because I'm remembering uh, <laughs> something from uh, my own past where a group of senior leaders was just very spontaneously asked, what are the five values of our company? <laughs> and more than half of them didn't know. They mean, of course, they read it at one point, but it was well, not, uh, you know, it didn't become part of their identity enough to actually know. <laughs> Did you have that too, Emma? Uh, I, I, it's also my personal <laughs> understanding that, yes, you don't really have to communicate the values. I also think that people should understand them. So I, I sometimes ask them or I try to understand if they are part of our day-to-day -day activity more than mm -hmm. explaining what they are. Because, yes, I had this experience in my own company that to, Yes, maybe I feel that the values of the company are so and so, but if I ask the people... It wasn't uh, then exactly yeah. the same at least, right? Yes, exactly. Mm. So it's a process, I think. Yeah. How about you? Mm, I am in a very positive experience about yeah. that. So, <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, uh, but so, which means probably you made sure that it becomes not like an occasional the annual, okay, let's review our values no, again. No, it was no. part of it was part what of the, you were talking about. In, not necessarily daily, but uh, yeah. anyway, at least to be mm. weekly feedback because people work on different things and uh, yeah. they reflect that. So, uh, yeah, uh, and but that's the role of the manager or the leader mm. to make sure that everything from this organizational culture uh, goes down to the relevant examples of today for the employee. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, of course, if culture is something we believe about culture, that it is uh, after you do your job, you go and you read something. This is not culture. Culture mm. is something alive. So you have to, you know, make it uh, work and put it a bit intertwined in whatever you do. I believe that maybe one of the reasons why we almost can't uh, mention it enough or display it enough because most teams are not static especially in large companies you have sure. every month 100 new employees you know so and how would they know you know of course and that, that is why you need the structure <clears throat> and mm -hmm. the foundation and you need to because they would see the uh, let's say the the existing employees and they will understand mm -hmm. that this is important for them so a bit of social pressure they will cope with the, yeah and way. I think there are laws, it always comes down to some micro moments or some micro decisions where you, really, where you really need to put your money where your mouth is. Like if you say that this company promotes I don't know what, I think that that thing should be really visible in the decisions you make. Absolutely. Like who do we promote or I don't know. Yeah. In yeah. a crisis situation, what do we do? Mm -hmm. And I think that's when people really 
understand, understand the values yes. if you are walking the talk or just exactly talk. yeah i agree with that actually it has to be in the ordinary actions of the day where these things need to be visible because otherwise of course there is the thing on paper that we have to memorize so yeah, to speak yeah. right yeah. Mm -hmm. okay so what, what else changed for you when you uh, went into uh, senior leadership roles with regards to your leadership focus is there anything about uh, perhaps uh, the, the the sphere of influence how that changed that also changed your way you have to lead yes definitely and that was one of the let's say biggest challenges because especially in the beginning because you come from you know a position in which you have your team you delivery but you are not so much connected with the rest of the organization but then uh, to make your team successful you have to invest in this influential uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> let's say role uh, and uh, for me in the beginning it was like a waste of time <laughs> because i was feeling that i should stay with my team grow yeah. them uh, and then i understood that uh, being investing more time to being exposed to for the other leaders to know mm. me that created the trust and therefore i gained back the time uh, making to align on decisions which were common or cross like all mm. the metrics organizations very fast and very beneficial because sometimes the other teams you know they came with a different approach and we uh, we uh, found uh, some solutions that we never thought on ourselves you know? yeah so uh, but that's something, uh, you know, I, and if I put it now, it is like managing uh, short term and mid term, you know, uh, projects, because this is something that doesn't have the return. So mm. you, at the beginning, when you are a young manager, leader, mm. whatsoever, you feel this pressure to constantly deliver. We should all, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, we need to see results at, at the end of each day. Um, uh, and that influential uh, or growing people, these are two areas in which you invest, 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 and return, you don't know, you don't have a precise time when it comes back. If, mm -hmm. but of course, <laughs> but I think it's I'm, also up to you. I'm quite sure it will eventually. <laughs> what do you think about that? Is it important difference in the leadership challenges as you progress? Yeah, I think you have to manage more and more stakeholders as you uh, as you become a senior leader i think you have to also manage the expectations up the, the expectations on the same level or maybe i don't know you need to if you're in business to business the expectations of the clients sure. and you have to align all these stakeholders and yes i think it's very important yeah it's like if you don't create the relationship and that gives you the trust and the credibility with peer leaders, rarely a team exists in complete isolation, right? They're always part of an ecosystem, of aren't course. they? So um, our job, I always uh, was thinking about it this way, is to help our team uh, clear the way, but the way is not only inside our team, the way is also exactly. a lot outside of our team, you know? Yeah. What's the point of being a really good manager for the people that you, that you lead, but you're unable to have a convincing conversation with the finance director about funding a budget request. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, no. So uh, they're out of a sudden you'll be quite lost. That's uh, that's very unfortunate. I mean, uh, if I would use a strong word, it's mm. like you handicap your team to, mm -hmm. to produce results. So, uh, but that is something that you learn on the way. So discussing about challenges. Uh, so yeah, no, yeah. I was wondering because uh, maybe one or the other um, freshly baked manager is, is listening to this. I wonder if there's something Hopefully. to learn uh, from this, even at the stage that they're in. Yeah. I, I would almost think that there is not any time too early to build relationships out of my immediate team, I would say. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I think it's about uh, personal leadership, even if mm. you don't have a team. It's uh, because today we are discussing about leadership at a, every level. So. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you have to build the credibility for yourself uh, in the position in which you are and then 
knowing what you are working for, and like we were discussing about uh, contribution, uh, of course you you can make your let's say support network. Yeah. Just to be told, half of the leaders that I made that I that I remember that was somewhere in the upper middle management um, did not do a very good job in creating a network outside of their immediate teams. I don't know, do you have a similar observation? From my perspective, it's a lot of, a lot of people are, are not really focusing on this and, and therefore have a lot of struggle and therefore by their own team members are very quickly seen as like a powerless manager, which creates, you know, a lot of, how do you say, dissatisfaction. Yeah. Because in the end, it affects you too as an individual sure, contributor. Sure. Does, well, does that, you know, can, do you I, I relate have a similar to this, observation? Yeah, I, I relate to this half and half because mm. I've seen... Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's like... The, yeah, I, I've seen also mm -hmm. leaders uh, very well uh, into this. Some of them overdoing, <laughs> yeah. uh, and then it becomes not networking and uh, business support, rather into political area, mm -hmm. which. Uh, uh, oh yeah, that can uh, be nice. And then uh, about the leaders which are not good at uh, trying to create this support network. Um, uh, I agree. I mean, uh, sometimes they may seem powerless, or it depends how they sell the story to their team because they could be like the local hero, you know, protecting from the <laughs> uh, influence of the rest of the organization or the rest of other uh, contradictory interests. Uh, uh, so, yeah, it really depends how, uh, how you sell the story. Uh, but the conclusion is the same. Uh, mm. If you do not have the support uh, of the rest of the organization, then your team will suffer. So stakeholder management becomes the yes the bigger subject. Or well, out of a sudden it becomes a subject. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and yeah. I think it also has another advantage. I think that if you stay only in your team and you don't go outside, whether it is by interacting with other peers or uh, I don't know, just with the market and networking, but I don't really like the word. I think that it's like you don't evolve. I mean, I feel like you need to also challenge your views and discuss with people with, that have the sure. same like, exactly. problems. Because otherwise, I think, yeah, you are mm. working on your project and you're the hero of your team. But sometimes you may just become stuck in a set of ideas and mindsets. and. Very true, very true. Why did you You don't like networking, you said. Why? I like networking. <laughs> the, the I don't term. like the word yeah. networking because I believe it's about building meaningful relationships yeah. and I'm not into switching business cards. <laughs> it's so just that. Mindful networking. Connecting. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Maybe. Um, um, I asked you because I was hoping you would say that uh, because I have a similar sentiment about that because, you know, and then working in the sense of um, creating connections to my sole advantage is something that actually is not going to work for a very long time. Yeah. I always thought that uh, building sustainable relationships requires to make a genuine connection. Exactly. And that's also inside networking. But mm. uh, I, I guess uh, this word has been overused and maybe... Yeah, it yeah. Have been, has, has a bit of a taste then. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> that's right. Well, we're closing in on the, in on the uh, end of our talk. So, but I wanted to uh, give both of you something, uh, in a, how do you say, a moment uh, in which you could answer the following question. If you look at yourselves, What's there left to learn? What would you say about yourself? From now on, what is left yeah, to learn? Yeah, what's left? You're both experienced leaders. What's left to learn? Oh, a lot. Yeah, I think <laughs> it never stops. <laughs> Point out I... one thing. <laughs> Point out. Um, so for me, uh, it, it is to learn how uh, to continue to, to build teams uh, and uh, to build teams and to unleash the potential of each individual and you know human are different so there is always something to learn you always have somebody that uh, puts you in a perspective that you never had and uh, i think that 
yeah, that's uh, that's the role of the leader. Uh, even if you do not uh, um, have team under you, uh, the role of mm-hmm. you as a mature person and the experience in leadership is to to share your knowledge and to be able to uh, to grow people. So for you, it's about the improvement of yes. things that you've already worked on. Yeah. You? Anything in particular you say? That's what I want to spend some time with. I always feel like whenever I feel like thing, I've got the hang of things. There's always a new challenge. <laughs> so <laughs> right. something like this. And I also believe in something that um, I heard. I don't remember where or I read that um, we feel like our role is to develop and improve, but actually is more a journey of coming back to self. And yes, I think that's more like it. <laughs> that's interesting. I like yeah, that. I think it's always a journey of self-discovery mm-hmm. and you feel like you know yourself, but you always discover something new, maybe because the market is changing or the generations are changing. Or you always... yourself. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Super. I found that was such an interesting talk. Thank you, Odaluka. Thank you, Miwara. Thank it was you a great too. pleasure. Thank you, Frank. <laughs> it was really nice. See you all next time.